Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming this morning. We're getting, we have a really gross, great program about uh, COPD and asthma. Uh, my name is Dr. Bonnie Sunday. I'm a, uh, a medical director here at Blue Cross Blue Shield and also a primary care physician. We're going to start with uh, Dr. Alan Salzman, who is a pulmonologist with uh, UB School of Medicine and also a medical director here at Blue Cross Blue Shield. He's going to speak about evidence-based guidelines to diagnose, evaluate, and manage mm -hmm. asthma and COPD. And then Ashley Holdsworth, one, one of our pharmacists at Blue Cross Blue Shield, is going to talk about medication options for asthma and COPD, COPD and give you some help with formula, uh, formulary uh, medications to select. I'm going to give a brief description of coding for asthma and COPD. And then uh, Jennifer Toole from uh, the Monroe Plan is going to uh, talk about services that are available through Blue Cross and Blue Shield to help with management of, of your patients. Uh, with uh, COPD, asthma, and other chronic medical conditions. So at this time, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Dr. Alan Seltzman. Welcome. I want to thank you all for coming on this beautiful morning. Uh, we should do this outside, but I guess that doesn't work really well. Um, so um, what we're going to talk about this morning is asthma and COPD. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to define what we mean by asthma and COPD. We're going to talk about guidelines for the diagnosis, education, and management of asthma, which are pretty well established. They're national guidelines. Uh, there are also evidence-based guidelines uh, for COPD, and we're going to do that. And as Bonnie talked about, we're also going to get into a little bit of coding and then the, the things that Blue Cross Blue Shield can offer you to, to help with your, with your patients. So, What's asthma? And I think it's important that we all understand the definition because what we do in terms of characterizing the disease and treating the disease depends on the definition. So asthma is a disease where there's obstruction to airflow. And the obstruction to airflow is caused by inflammation in the airways. And the inflammation in the airways is a certain type of inflammation, mostly with eosinophils. And it results in increased airway responsiveness. We get airway narrowing, and we get airway obstruction. And the airway obstruction is reversible in, in many patients. It can occur at any age. It most frequently occurs in the young, but it can occur in the old as well. But the key here is that this airway obstruction is reversible in most patients. So a lot of people have asthma. It's probably a little more than 10% of the population. Um, um, 34 million people, a population of a little over 300 million. Uh, lots of kids. Um, lots of visits to hospital outpatients in emergency rooms. And the asthma costs are huge nationally, about $30 billion a year. And interestingly enough, the amount of asthma in the U.S., as well as in other developed countries, is growing. So it has something to do with environmental factors. The clean environment that we've created for ourselves seems to increase the incidence of allergies and asthma. You don't find it in rural areas so much, and you don't find it in third world countries. So this is a disease of developed nations. So COPD is a very difficult disease to define because for years we've talked about chronic bronchitis and emphysema. And, and although you're going to hear about that when we talk about coding, they, they really are very hard terms to use when you're dealing with patients. Chronic bronchitis is a, is a disease which is uh, defined epidemiologically, somebody who has cough for a couple months a year for two years in a row. Emphysema is a pathologic diagnosis. We have dilatation of air spaces and destruction of the walls of alveoli. But these two go together, and they go together in such a way it's hard to sort them out. And patients get confused. They say, well, one doctor said I had bronchitis. The other one said I had emphysema. And we call it COPD. So a group came together and decided to define COPD in very simple terms, where it's a common, preventable, and treatable disease. It's very important for your patients to understand that. It's characterized by persistent airflow obstruction. They 
maybe a little bit reversible, but it's usually progressive. It doesn't get all better like most patients with asthma can. It's associated with a chronic inflammatory response in the airway, and the inflammation is different than the inflammation we get with asthma. And it's uh, due to noxious particles or gases. In the U.S., 95% of that is due to smoking. But since the world has people migrating from all over the place, which you need to understand, especially if you have people who are coming here from third world countries. In third world countries, especially with people live in single room houses where they're cooking on a stove in the middle of the room and they're using wood and other biomass fuels, exposure to that kind of situation can lead to the development of COPD. And you see that a lot in women who are around these fires cooking all the time, who may not have ever smoked. <coughs> And the exacerbations and comorbidities continue to the severity of the disease. So this is a, a, a persistent airflow obstruction. It's a progressive disease. But we can do things to make people treatable. It's preventable if you don't smoke or you stay away from those other things that can, that can cause the, the problems. COPD is also very common, but it's also under-recognized. So if you add the numbers together, again, 30 million, similar probably to the numbers we have in asthma, but about half those people are unrecognized. It's one of the few diseases where, as a cause of death, it's increasing. For almost everything else, cancer, heart disease, the, the rates of death are decreasing. For COPD, we're increasing. It's now the fourth leading cause of death in the U.S. And the cost, both direct and indirect, uh, people losing work, the direct uh, cost of, of care is very high, over $40 billion a year. So let's compare and contrast a little bit. So asthma onset is often early, can be in childhood, uh, but again, you can see it later. COPD is usually in midlife, 40s and 50s. If you see it earlier, you worry about some inherited kind of a problem. <clears throat> As the symptoms vary, they can one day they can be fine, part of the day they can be fine, another part of the day they can be terrible. With COPD, the symptoms are slowly progressible, progressive. They may vary a little bit, but they're going to be there. With asthma, the symptoms tend to be worse at night. Um, these people often, but not always, have clear-cut allergies, uh, such as rhinitis or eczema. Um, is often a family history of asthma. And again, it's largely reversible airflow limitation. For COPD, we said that it's a progressive disease. In this country, there's a long smoking history, almost always present. They have exertional dyspnea. And it's largely irreversible when you look at airflow obstruction. And we're talking a lot about airflow obstruction. So as we're going to talk about, measuring that airflow obstruction is key to the management and follow up of both these diseases. <clears throat> In order to measure the airflow obstruction, you need to do spirometry. And we're going to talk about that a bunch. And you need to do it, at least initially, both before and after a bronchodilator. In asthma, the disease has a lot of reversibility. Although if somebody is really bad when you first see them, that may not be reversible initially. But as you follow them over time, you'll see the improvement. The medications that we use for reversibility are bronchodilators. But if the disease has lots of inflammation and swelling in the airways, that bronchodilator may not have an immediate effect. But as you treat them for a while, it's going to get better, and you're going to see a big improvement in their pulmonary functions. So you'll see reversibility in asthma. In COPD, there may be a little bit of reversibility. But again, it's a progressive disease. Chest x-rays, as a general rule, are, are not good tools when one wants to look at diseases of the airway. We're looking at airway obstruction. We're looking at air. And air doesn't show up on x-rays. It's black. Diseases that cause things to come into the lung, like pneumonia or cancer, x-rays are good for that, but they're not good for asthma or COPD. So when do you get an x-ray? When you think something else is going on. 
when your patient may not be responding to things and you're worried there's something else going on, or if they have an intercurrent illness and you think they might have pneumonia, then it's worth getting an x-ray. But a routine chest x-ray really isn't indicated in the management of, of, of uh, asthma or really COPD. <clears throat> but what's important for both disease, diseases is prevention of things that will exacerbate their disease. So flu vaccine and Pneumovax are really important in all your patients. So let's talk about um, a patient uh, with asthma, 45-year-old, uh, presents to the office. She complains of shortness of breath and wheezing. She's got a history of, of asthma. Um, so you ask her some questions. You want to know about her symptoms. Uh, when does she wheeze? Does she have any cough or sputum? Does she wheeze all day long? Is it mostly at night? Are there things that trigger it? Triggers can be <coughs> allergies, as we mentioned before, but it also can be dust and fumes, things in the house, dust, dust mites, uh, cockroaches, cigarette smoking. Uh, some people with asthma uh, are sensitive to exercise. And exercise, as well as other things, may, may trigger them off. There are some people who only will get wheezing with exercise. Um, in fact, it's an issue with some, some uh, high-performance Olympic athletes who will only get wheezing with, with exercise. And there's medications you can give them before the exercise that, that helps with that. Uh, respiratory infections will often trigger an exacerbation of, of asthma. And you want to know about the medications they're on. Uh, whether they're on uh, inhalers and what types of inhalers, and we'll talk about that a little bit, or whether they're on steroids or other medications, if they smoke, and again, if there's a, a family history. And for our patient, she used to smoke. She quit about 15 years ago. She wheezes uh, every day. Uh, she has an albuterol inhaler that she uses uh, every day for relief of her wheezing. She wakes up at least one night a week with, with, with cough. She's short of breath with exercise. She works in a, in a factory. Working in a factory is not by itself a risk factor for asthma. Um, it used to be that some factories really had a lot of dust and stuff. Those plants there are few and far between uh, uh, now. And she's had a couple of exacerbations in the last six months where she's had to take uh, oral steroids. The key test when you're evaluating somebody with asthma or COPD is spirometry. And what spirometry is is a way to indirectly <laughs> measure how fast the air is coming out of the lungs because, as we said, these are diseases where there's obstruction to airflow. And the classic test we use is a test called the forced vital capacity where you take a deep breath in as deep, as deep as you can and you blow it out as hard and fast as you can. You keep blowing for at least six seconds so all the air is out. And on this graph here, we have the volume that you're blowing out over time. And the volume you blow out we call the forced vital capacity. And what we're interested in besides the forced vital capacity is how much you blow out in the first second, which we call the forced expiratory volume in one second. Uh, and that FEV1 is a key test to look at. And we can also look at what percentage of the vital capacity you blow out in the first second or the, the FEV1, FEC ratio. If you get a fancier piece of equipment, this information can also be displayed in what we call a flow volume loop. And instead of looking at a time recording, we're looking at instantaneous flow rates as the volume comes out of the lungs. So the volume here is on the x-axis, and here we're going from full inspiration to full expiration. And what happens when you do a maximum forced expiration is flow rapidly rises to a peak and then comes, kind of comes down in this almost straight line fashion. And this is inspiration, but we're not going to talk much about inspiration. And most gadgets will put a little tick on this line where the FEV1 is. But what I like about this is it gives you a visual picture. And I'll show you some examples why this visual picture is really nice uh, when you're trying to look at what patients are doing. So, so let's look at our, our, our patient. So she does a 